Well, I would say, Glenn, that means then that you're really young, right? That's what I like to always think. Before we, uh, our sermon here today, before I start talking, uh, let's have a word of prayer, please. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I uh, thank you for this Sabbath day. Father, I uh, just want to say thank you for your leading, your interest, and your involvement in my life. Lord, I just pray that uh, everyone here can say that same thing. Today, Father, I just pray that your uh, spirit would be here. Father, I pray that your spirit would, uh, would be in me today and that it would speak through me. Lord, so this message is, is yours, is not, not mine, and that each person here would hear what you would have them here today. And I pray in your name, amen. So uh, it's a new year, and that's what uh, I'm going to talk about today. The title of my sermon is New Beginnings. So new year, new beginnings. And I want to read through our scripture again. And I'm going to read kind of the the kiddie version, not the uh, adult version that Emma read for us. But um, this is kind of the kid's version. I think I pulled this out of uh, one of my child's... uh, kid's Bible, actually, but I liked the way that it actually uh, worded these verses a little better. So, Ephesians 5, 15 through 17. And in this version, it said, Be very careful, then, how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. So that verse sounds a little good and then maybe a little scary in there too, right? But as we look back on this past year, what do uh, what were some of the things that happened? What were some of the big stories? Does anybody know? I know according to Google what the top 5 were of this last year. Does anybody think they can guess or tell me what what those were, or one of them? Election? Election? No. No. Hurricanes. Hurricanes. Mr. Greg, the scholar here, actually two of them were in the top five stories according to Google this last year. There was Irma and Harvey. Okay, what else? Anybody else? Shooting. Shooting. There was a shooting in Las Vegas. Yes, there was. Fires? No fires, but something that is very hot, but then became very cold or very dark. The kids all, the eclipse, that's right. That's right, the eclipse. That was kind of a big deal, right? It was actually a good deal. I actually have video of Blake. Tracy was videoing him during the eclipse, and he asked her if it was time to go to bed because it got dark. And then there was one other that was number five of the top five, and this one I totally surprised me. I guess I haven't been paying attention to the news, but it deals with money and a specific type of money. A new type, yes, the Bitcoin. That was number five of top stories for this last year because the value of it has increased so much. Um, I believe the price of one Bitcoin is at 17, I forget, I think it's 1700 or 17,000, I forget. It was 17 something. Something outrageous, it seems like. Should have bought it when it was actually a dollar. That was a <laughs> huge screw up there. My father likes to talk about how he used to be able to buy Walmart when it first started and uh, he could have retired as a millionaire. If you would have bought some Bitcoins, I think you could have sold those and retired. But So those were the top five stories this last year. So it's a little bit of good there, but. A little bit of bad, too, right? Had a couple hurricanes, a shooting. So predictions for the future. What is the future going to hold? Anybody remember the Jetsons? I just saw that the other day. And wow, does the cool technology out of that look really out of date. The vacuum cleaner was um, looks nothing like one of those Roombas, I'll say that for sure. But back in 1967, Experts predicted that by the turn of the century, technology would have taken over so much of the work that we do of an average American that our work week would only be 
22 hours long. And that we would only work 27 weeks out of the year. As a result, they said that our biggest problems would be in deciding what to do with all of our leisure time. Has that happened to anybody? Yeah, I mean, it's, it seems almost ridiculous, does it not? But in 67, that was the prediction, that we were going to have so much leisure time, we couldn't figure out what to do with it. So in this second Saturday of 2018, I wonder, how are we going to do this year? Will we be as busy? Will we make any better use of our time? And in the 300 and I believe 51 days till when 2018 is over and we look back on it, will it be with joy or regret? Will we, will we be looking to the future with anticipation or with dread? So I think our scripture today can help us out. And so let's read, I'm going to read that again. It says, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Now, I think Paul has given us a good message, and he's put some important lessons into this text for us, ones that I think we can consider as we look forward to this year. And I think as he talks through there, one of the messages that he's telling us is that our time here on earth is limited. And I think as Christians, that's something that we all understand. And if we look back on those news stories of the top five, three of those are pretty evident that our time on this earth is limited. So first of all, we must be careful how we live because of that limited amount of time that we have. And David wrote, he said, Show me, O Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. Let me know how fleeting my life is. And then later he said, The length of our days is 70 or 80 years. If we have the strength, they quickly pass and we fly away. Now, when we were kids, 40 seemed old. I remember thinking that 40 was old. I mean, really old. I think I'm 41. As you get older, that time, man, does it fly. Now, I thought this last year went really quick. And in fact, uh, Tracy was going through pictures this last year of the thousands that we have taken. And she was going through and we were looking through some baby pictures of the kids. And thinking back uh, 12 years ago when even Hunter was born. And you think, man, 12 years, that's a little chunk of time. Maybe not lots, but that's a pretty decent amount of time, right? But it seems like yesterday. I can still remember when he was born and how little he was and some of the little things that he did, how cute and nice and sweet he was. (laughs) I won't remark on what he's like now, but, you know, that time, it passes so quickly for us, and it's going away. I think sometimes the mistake we we make is thinking that it is going to last forever, and it's not. You know, a few years ago, I found that, uh, as I was doing some little research here, People Magazine published an article, and it was called Dead Ahead. And it told about how there was a new clock that kept track of how much time you had left on this earth to live. It took the average of 75 years for men, and 80 years for a woman. You put in your sex and your age into the clock, and from then on, for only $99.95, it would tell you exactly how much time you had left to live. You know, neither you nor I have any guarantee that we have even one more day to live. And in fact, the Bible tells us not to count on tomorrow, because tomorrow may not come for us. All we have is right now. So yes, our time on earth is valuable because it is limited. So 
I believe Paul is telling us that we need to make the most of every opportunity. And he gives us a reason. He says, because the days are evil. So why are our days evil? Well, I think this comes back to that Jesus said that Satan is a robber and a thief. And one of the things that he tries to rob from us is our time because he knows what a precious possession it is. And if we think about it, think about the time that's wasted in, in sinning and just pull out some simple ones, maybe in, in spending your time at, at gambling casinos or, or maybe in the time that we spent in something more simple but maybe just as evil in gossiping or talking about our neighbors or spreading rumors. Think about the time wasted in worrying about the consequences of sins or hiding our sins that we have committed. Satan, he is a thief and a robber. But it's not just sin that makes demands on our times. Sometimes it's the good things. Now, I think we all remember, but the story of Jesus. It's about Jesus, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, right? He goes to their house, and he's talking. And Mary, she's sitting in his feet, just absorbing every word that he's saying. While Martha, she's in the kitchen making lunch, right? Now, in that story, Martha, she gets mad because her sister's being lazy and sitting in there and not helping. And so, finally, she gets so tired of it, she marches in there, and I can just imagine it. She just marches right in there to Jesus. And she says, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. I mean, we can see that, right? I mean, you can imagine how mad she is. I mean, I think back on my own life. My brother, slacker, would be sitting there not doing anything. I had to do all the work, and I, you'd go complain to mom and dad, right? Now, I experienced that this week. I took Jason and Kelly's boys and my boys out shoveling, and of course, the older children complained that their younger brothers were sitting in a snowbank, not shoveling snow. We all do it, right? Mary, she, she's mad. But Jesus, he replies to her and he says, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken from her. Now, was Martha committing a sin by fixing a meal? No, she wasn't. But I think the problem is, is that she missed or she was so preoccupied with fixing that meal that she forgot that the Son of God was sitting in her living room. Now, how many times do we make that mistake? I think back in my own life, and I think I make that mistake almost every day. I get so caught up in the here and in the now and what I have to do that I fail to deal with the eternal in my life the things that are going to last forever and ever. Now, we talked about how the prediction was we were going to have so much free time, but we all laugh at that because we don't. Now, there was a, a doctor, that, a Dr. Swenson, that had done a book, and in that he discussed that one of our major health problems is based upon anxiety and stress which relates back to overload. We are overloaded. We're overloaded with commitments. We've committed ourselves to go here, to go there, to take part in this activity or that social function. And as a result, result we soon begin meeting ourselves, coming and going, because we have overloaded ourselves with commitments. But you know, we're also overloaded with possessions. Our closets are full. Our garages are overflowing. Now, I was thinking about that as I, as I thought about that. And if you've ever been to my house, I have several sheds. And one of them is quite large. It would be as big as the total gym here would be. 
I have another one that's half that size. I have a garage. When I first moved out there, I remember somebody saying to me, how would I ever fill all that space? Now it's so full, I'm considering I think I need to build another shed just to put stuff in. We have so much junk or things. How many people do we see that have gone into debt to pay for all those things? Because we simply must have. So, lastly, I think we're overloaded in the area of work. We get up early, we fight traffic, experience jobs that, in the end, we say we hate, all because we need to pay for all of those possessions that we've accumulated. And then there's the information overload. So how many ways can you get information these days? Is there, what, half a dozen news channels on TV? Plus, you've got what's online on the internet. There's Facebook. There's Snapchat. We are overloaded with information. And in fact, the same doctor that had written that earlier article He had said just to keep up on medical knowledge, he would have to read 220 articles a month just to keep current with what's happening. Is there a way that we can keep current with what's happening? Or are we just overloaded? So as we look at all this, what is God's will or what is God's plan for us? And I think Paul tells us, he says, Do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Now, what do you think God's will is for you in your life? Do we think he wants our minds saturated with worries, anxieties that we can't take care of, things that we can't do, taking over the time that we can use for spiritual thoughts? Does he want our calendar so crowded that we don't have time for those eternal things. What is God's will for my life this year? Well, first of all, I think we need to establish our priorities. And since you're here in church today, I'm assuming that you believe God should be part of your life, should be one of those priorities. And as you're going through establishing your priorities for this year, you have to decide Just where does God stand in your life? Who or what is going to be most important this year? Now, I'm hoping your answer is going to be God. I'm hoping that you're going to say, my relationship with God is going to be the most important thing to me this year. And that I am going to put that at the top of my list at priorities. So that as I go through my calendar every day, As I go through my schedule, as I look at the decisions that I make, as I look at my relationship with others, my whole outlook on life is going to be a result because God is the top. So therefore, when Saturday rolls around, neither rain, snow, or beautiful sunny weather is going to keep me from being here to worship because God comes first in my life and nothing is going to interfere with that. I think part of that priority of making God first in our life is that we have to work on that relationship with him. That relationship with God has got to be number one. And in my worship that Tracy and I have been doing lately, we talk, we've been looking at that relationship and talking about it, and it really um, came home to me in that we need to have that intimate love relationship with Christ. That, that relationship with Christ has to be number one, and it has to be a relationship that we understand him better than we understand our spouse, because it is a love relationship that we have to have with him. Now, I think also 
We should put some priorities of our family, right? What else besides that could we maybe uh, place as an eternal priority? I know for me, one of my priorities for an eternal one is to have my kids eternally in heaven. So we need to make times for our family, for our children. We need to make time for our spouses. Set aside a date night, maybe. A time of no cell phone, no tablet, no interruptions, so that we can concentrate on each other. Now, unfortunately, we, most of us probably uh, have to work. We don't have trust funds that we're living off of. I keep asking my dad when mine's going to kick in so I can quit working. It hasn't happened yet. I'm a little bitter. But as Christians, when somebody employs us, they should be getting a good bargain, right? They should be getting a good deal, knowing that we're going to put in an honest day's work for them, that we're not going to cheat them. I think we have that responsibility to God to honor him in the way that we work. So first we need to establish our priorities, of which God and our relationship needs to be number one. And then number two, because we don't have that guarantee of tomorrow, I think we need to live every day. Uh, We need to learn how to live for today. Two of our greatest enemies of time are regrets about things that we did in the past and anxiety about what will happen to us in the future. Many of us are either living in the past or in the future. In fact, how many times do we get involved or engaged in that little game of, I wish it were tomorrow. I wish it were next week. I wish it were next month. You know, as kids, man, used to wish that school would be over, right? Well, there's this story that I was looking in through, and um, it was actually uh, one by a a Gary Freeman, and he tells about a girl who she goes off to college. She hates it. It's terrible. But she tells herself, she says, if I can ever get out of college, get married, and have kids, I know I'll finally be able to enjoy life. Well, so she gets through college. She gets married. She has kids. And wow, she discovered those kids are a lot of work. So she's sitting there telling herself, you know, if I can just get these kids raised, get them out of the house, then I am going to be able to sit back and relax. Well, the kids, they get older, they're in high school, getting ready to go to college, and her husband sits down and says, we don't have enough money to send these kids to college. You're going to have to get a job. And she didn't want to get a job, but, you know, Got to send these kids to school, so, so she did. So she goes out and she gets a job. She hates it. It's terrible. But if she can just suck it up and get through for the next few years, get these kids through school, then she can quit and she'll be able to enjoy life. <laughs> so the last kid graduates from college. She goes into the boss's office and says, I am going to quit. And he says, whoa, wait a second. You don't want to do that. If you work just eight more years, you can have a pension. You don't want to give that up, do you? Well, man, that's, I hate my job, but no, that's, that's a lot of money, so I guess I, I don't want to quit. So she works the eight more years, finally quits, retires. Her and her husband, they buy a little cabin off in the mountains, and they're sitting on it, this little swing at night, And they're sitting there and they're looking back through a photo album and they're dreaming and thinking about the good old days. You know, we live in a time of wishing. What about today? There's a quote that says, Life is what happens to you while you're making plans to do something else. It's true, isn't it? Now, another year has come and gone. A new year stretches before us. I would implore 
that God would help us to redeem the time and that we may have a happy year. And so in this next year, I've got uh, just a couple little things that I want to go through. So guys, if you can put that slide up here so everybody can see it. So during this new year, I wish that you may have enough happiness to keep you sweet, enough trials to keep you strong, enough sorrow to keep you human, enough hope to keep you happy, enough failure to keep you humble, enough success to keep you eager, enough friends to give you comfort, enough wealth to meet your needs, enough enthusiasm to make you look forward to tomorrow, and enough determination to make each day better than the day before. Romans 13, 11 through 12 says, The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber, because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. So for our closing hymn today, I've picked a song, as I quite often do, that I want you guys to listen to. They're going to play it up on uh, the screen here for us. And I hope, uh, I hope it has as good a message to you as it did to me.